Hallelujah. Before moms lose their mind. Hallelujah. It just doesn't get old. Going after God doesn't get old. It actually is refreshing. It doesn't get tiring. Listen, if you get tired now worshiping God, you're going to have a rough time in heaven, let me tell you. Because when we get around the throne of God, we're going to worship. We're going to praise. Listen, and you know what the thing about it is? You might as well get your practice on now. You know what I'm saying? Just get it on. I'm going to leave that one alone. Because if y'all would go ahead and get it on like you used to get it on in the club when it comes to worship. Or like some, how some of you want to go get it on in the club. Or, okay, let's be real about it. Or like how some of you, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the internet crowd. And how some of them are getting it on in the club. Because I know you ain't doing that, right? I know you living it right, right? Right? Can I get an amen there at least? Come on, somebody. Come on. I want to welcome you guys. I'm excited that you're here. I'm pumped because my spiritual father is here to preach today. Come on, somebody. If you were here for the first service and that, that, that whatever, whatever that was, that click started and, and those kinds of things just messed me up. And just, that, that, that. I'm good now, so we'll go ahead and get past right that. Um, what I want to do is I want to show this video from the City Beach Network. Pastor Angelo is going to come right after that. He'll take it from there and, and, and run with it, and we'll go as far as, and, and, and we'll go as deep. Yeah, that, that's it right there, Pastor Angelo. That, that, I'm not, I don't want to take away your summary, but let's dig deep. Let's dig deep. And we ain't talking about insanity, okay, for those of you out here. <laughs> let's go. That's okay. That's okay. 7 o'clock tomorrow for the insanity crowd. So that's 7 p.m. tomorrow for the insanity crowd, maybe 7.15. Um, some of you have been missing and, and really slacking. Okay, so I'm not talking about you, Elsa, Elisa. Okay. Anyway, um, and the other guys aren't here either, so I can't talk about them either. Love you guys. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that uh, you're allowing God to do a work in your life on Father's Day. And roll that clip. City Reach Network, using unlikely people in overlooked places for extraordinary things to lay claim to that which Jesus has already paid for. Ryan Bolt started City Reach Church in 2005, and out of that God gave him a vision for City Reach Network, which started in 2009. City Reach Network raises up leaders to plant churches in urban areas to reach people through compassion ministries such as weekend services, hope homes, and community events. I'll never forget when God began to stir in my heart uh, to plant a church in the city of Pittsburgh. I was in California, I was newly saved, and I was at a service, there was 20,000 people there, and God began to just deal with me. God began to break me. God began to just put such a burden in my heart for the city of Pittsburgh. And I, there is when God began to say, you know, speak to me about planting a church in the city of Pittsburgh. And it'd be a church where people's lives would be transformed, a church where people would be empowered to do everything God had called them to do, be a church for people to be redeemed and restored. And I always, I had a sense in my spirit that it would be more than just one church, that the church would also plant churches. Beginning that day, City Reach Network began to quickly multiply. Within three years of Brian receiving the vision, there were six City Reach Network churches. City Reach Network has evolved into a place where people can find second chances and renewed purpose and renewed vision in their lives. This year, the network will launch multiple churches with five of them starting on the same day, Sunday, September 15th. It's been amazing. God has given us this vision to see churches planted, to see 50 churches through City Reach Network over the next 10 years. And where there's vision, there's always provision. And you know, one of the ways we've been doing this is by unique partnerships. And we partner with Network of Hope. Before we plant a church, we go into the community and establish a compassion-based nonprofit to meet the needs and to serve the community. We want to make sure that people's physical needs are met. We have food banks. We have hope homes. 
We take men and women that have life controlling issues and watch Jesus transform their lives. We do uh, backpack giveaways. We do so many different things. We give out toys to kids at Christmas time. We go in and serve the community and out of that burst of life giving church. City Reach Network has seen God transform so many people into great leaders to spread the gospel. There is still so much opportunity with a harvest that is ready. City Reach Network looks to the future with great expectancy for all that God will do. If the last few years are any indication what the future holds for City Reach Network, we are on an amazing journey with Jesus. I believe we're at a tipping point in our network to see such a great harvest come into the kingdom of God through cities and regions, to see them impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am so excited what God is going to do, how he's going to transform lives, how he's going to restore situations, how he's going to set people free, how he's going to speak to that valley of dry bones and watch it come alive through Jesus. I am so excited. God is going to do miracle after miracle after miracle. City Reach Network is a story of man's radical faith and God's never-ending faithfulness. For City Reach Network, this is only the beginning. City Reach Network. Using unlikely people in overlooked places for extraordinary things to lay claim to that which Jesus has already paid for. for God. Hallelujah. Go God. Mm. Isn't that, is this water for me as well? Glory to God. Water is multiplying. It's, it's a good thing. It's, it's the essence of my message. Well, it's so good to be with you here at City Reach Reading. My old stomping grounds. Love the city of Reading. Love the people of Reading. Love the people of City Reach Church in Reading. Amen. Mighty warriors for the kingdom. Mm. So good to be with you. I'm going to try to get through my messages. I think I can do it quicker than, than the first service. But you know what? You never know with me. But it's my beautiful bride, Teresa. She's an awesome woman of God. And uh, she works for the uh, Network of Hope out in, in Pittsburgh. One of the things that she does, she's pastoring uh, women's homes and, and uh, overseeing coordinators of homes and uh, the coordinator of coordinators. You didn't think she was that coordinated, but she is. Just bring a greeting, babe. <laughs> well, it is an amazing journey, and we're just so glad to be part of what God is doing all over the country, all around the world, and we're just so thankful for the, the part of our journey that was here and the greater things that God is doing. So get ready. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, beautiful. You know, it's just so exciting. We're, we're going to be, we really, we doubled as a network last year. We went from three to six churches, and we will probably double this year as well. And, you know, if you keep on doubling, that, that, that gets big real quick. And we are, Pastor Brian was saying, we're at a tipping point. God is mushrooming this thing. God is like, he, he rolled up the snowball in the first place. He put it on the top of the mountain, and he started rolling it down the hill. And that baby is gaining momentum. And we're just thankful for what God's doing. Uh, I, I love City Reach Network. We're, we're not about ourselves. We're about Jesus. Amen. We preach Jesus Christ you know, in places where people don't want to go and preach Jesus Christ. And, you know, we just, we're watching God do amazing things. And, um, you know, just to see him raise up and connect the other church planters to us and people with a burden for, for cities. We, um, a couple just moved in from Parker, Arizona. There were youth pastors down in the church in Parker, Arizona. They drove, they, they cross country uh, for a week and they landed, they came to Pittsburgh. They'll be there over the summer. And then they'll be moving to Toledo because God put a, a burden for Toledo in his heart before he ever got to Toledo. Before he ever visited Toledo, he had a vision from God to plant the church in Toledo, Ohio, which is a really, I mean, another devastated city, a city where there was once a great boom of industry and just, um, just a great need there. And so he's in 
Um, he's in Pittsburgh for the, for the summer with his lovely wife, Tara, and their two sons, Josiah and uh, Elisha. They're six and four. No, they're four and three, I think. They're young, but they're big. And uh, we were enjoying some meatball ministries with them last Sunday. We had, a, we had a family in, and they're still there. As a matter of fact, Bobby Bledsoe is preaching all three. three we have three services on the north side in Pittsburgh now. And uh, Bobby Bledsoe, his wife, Jade, and, and their two children, who are six and four, um, Gabriel, their son, and Selah, their daughter, they uh, were in from Bangor, Maine. Uh, have you ever heard of Bangor, Maine? Uh, we used to sing a song that this old guy named Roger Miller wrote. It was King of the Road, and the second verse said, Third boxcar, midnight train, destination, Bangor, Maine. That's all I ever knew of Bangor, Maine, that it was a line in a song. I figured it existed where it was. I think they have to pipe sunlight into it up there in the far northeast region of, of, the, of the country, up in Maine. But, you know, God has connected him with us and another ex heroin and crack cocaine addict that the Lord has radically saved and called and put a great gift of God in his life. They have such a heart for people and for the kingdom, and they, they stayed with us. We actually, uh, we left for Pittsburgh yesterday morning. They were still, still kind of hanging out at our house, and we're going to be going to a hotel, but just to see what God is doing, and guess what? God is raising you up as well to be a part of, 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 of all of this, this snowballing effect that the Lord is bringing and so one of the one of my functions within the, the, the church and the network is I'm going to be going around to these churches that are being planted maybe once a month going out from Pittsburgh and just encouraging the body of Christ encouraging the new church plants and the uh, the pastors and their families just to keep strong just to keep going forward and to believe God for greater things so this is kind of like a uh, even thank you so much Pastor CJ for opening your pulpit and inviting me to preach here on Father's Day. It's kind of a first fruits of what will be happening more and more in, in, in our ministry within the network. And, but Pastor Brian both has also charged me with a champion, championing, that's a tough word to say with my mouth, championing prayer <laughs> out at the, the Northside Church and also throughout the network. And I know you're in a prayer series here, uh, The Circle Maker and uh, we're drawing circles around people that are far from God in order to bring them into the kingdom, amen? We're drawing circles around whole families and around neighborhoods, around cities like Reading. We're drawing circles around states and around regions. You know, uh, uh, Pastor Jeff Leak, who's the pastor of uh, Allison Park Church out in, in Pittsburgh, it has he actually birthed, you know, he planted Pastor Brian in Pittsburgh. And so Allison Park Church was our mother church out there and he also founded a, a ministry network a church planting network called reach northeast and um and just his network really launched our network city reach network and so he's kind of like a father in the faith and pastor cj was out there at the end of may with the mike clicks and they stayed with us at the house and we were at this great um a conference one day conference called ignite i mean was that just packed with the electricity of god just a whole bunch of crazy people saying we can we can take this northeast we can plant churches in places that nobody you know we can send unlikely people to overlook places to do extraordinary things for jesus because he's paid the price for every soul in those cities amen and so they were out we had a great time but we had heard that there was supposed to be a prayer meeting at 7 30 in the morning before this conference amen so Pastor CJ and I and Mike, we got up early, even though we had stayed up pretty late. They just got in. I don't know what time you guys got in, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And we even stayed up later than that. But we got up early, and we went there to pray. And nobody knew where the prayer meeting was. It didn't seem like one was going on. And so you know, I said, yeah, we could go home and hang out because we're just a mile from that church. Or we could start our own prayer meeting. And Mike said, hey, we're here. Let's pray. You know, so we started our own prayer meeting up in the chapel. That was our last stop to see if one was going on already. So we just began to pray. And there were other people that apparently had heard that there was supposed to be a prayer meeting at 730. And they figured we were it. You know, so they, they came and they joined us. We had this amazing time of prayer. And that just kicked off the day, you know. And, and so uh, I, I want to preach about prayer here. It's not going to be something that's from the circle maker, but it's right in line with what you guys are, are, are looking at and studying and what Pastor CJ is, is bringing. So can we look in the Word? Amen. Uh, again, I, do, I did a first service. I'll do it again to steal a page from Pastor CJ's book. I want to say heart, ears, heart, ears. 
All right, I'm going to read a passage of Scripture from Colossians in chapter 1. And try to get through this thing faster if I can. It's the Word of God is so rich. Sometimes I just like to camp there for a while. Pastor CJ does the same thing. He preached out at the north side uh, on the 31st, the day after that conference out there. Did an amazing job, brought a great word. We had great ministry. Uh, Pastor CJ loves to pause. Sometimes he says more in his pauses than he said prior to it. It's kind of like Pastor Bill Johnson out in Redding, California. He says more than I can say when he's not saying anything. You know, and, uh, but that's when God speaks to people. But I'll try to get through this without too many pauses. And so Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 6 through 14. And then jump over to Colossians 4 and read verse 12. And try to get through this uh, and just really feel that the Lord wants to bring greater breakthrough in prayer. Wants to encourage us just to, uh, to, to be a people of prayer because that's when the power of God is released. I don't know if I'm ever going to get into this scripture here. <laughs> but, you know... Prayer and evangelistic ministry, prayer and the proclamation of the gospel go hand in hand. If you just have one or the other, you really don't have the full, the full package of what God wants to bring. Because if you're just speaking you know, a message with human efforts, you're not going to have the power of God displayed. But if you just keep building up a whole bunch of power supply and you never connect it to where the need is, you're not going to have the, need, the power of God released. And so prayer is kind of like, it becomes like a nuclear power plant, and it, it's got to be connected to the grid to reach the people where they are, amen? And that's doing the things that God has called us to do as his people, loving people, bringing a, a, an encouraging word, speaking the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is in the gospel, amen? It is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. You know, and it's, it's released through a people of prayer that have the power of God flowing through them. I don't know how I got off into that thing, but I probably had something else I wanted to say in there too, but I forgot it, so you can praise God for that. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 says, This gospel, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom, I'm sorry, through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. This is the updated New International Version that I'm not used to. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then Colossians 4 verse 12 says, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Thank you, Lord God, for your word, for your presence, for the supernatural ministry of your Holy Spirit. Continue to have your way in this place, in our lives, Lord, today and every day from, this, from, from today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Jesus was a man of prayer. Prayer was primary in the life of Jesus. He's our Savior. He set the example for the way we should live our lives. And he was a man of prayer. We see him waking up early in the morning to pray. We see him leaving crowds of people to find a solitary place on a mountain and commune with Father. We see him spending whole nights sometimes in prayer. As a matter of fact, after he spent a whole night in prayer one night, he called 12 men to himself, 12 men that nobody else had chosen, and he called them to himself because Father must have said, these are the guys I want you to pick. These are the ones that I'm going to use. 
the unlikely ones. I'm going to send them to the overlooked places to do extraordinary things for me. And so he called 12 men to himself that he designated as apostles. But in Mark it says that he called them to himself that they might be with him. That they might be with him. Our first ministry, our first responsibility is just to be with Jesus. I prayed this over. I think it might have been uh, Elsa uh, in the first, uh, well, no, Elisa, I think in the first, at the end of the first service. But, you know, to be with Jesus. We need to be with Jesus. And that begins with prayer. That begins just with communing with the Father, with the Lord. We don't, don't complicate prayer. It's communion. It's dialogue. It's, it's, it's crying out to the Lord, it's opening your ear to listen to the Lord, and then it's moving out in obedience, it's moving out in faith to do what God is saying I'm going to do, to believe God for big things, to believe God for the impossible. God is the God of the impossible. Nothing's impossible for him. Nothing is too big for him. Nothing is too difficult for him. Can God use you? Absolutely. Absolutely. He's already using you. And he's got greater things in store for you. So Jesus called them that they would be with him. Then that he would send them out with authority. Authority comes after we've submitted to him. With authority to preach the gospel and to cast out demons in his name. And if you'll just spend time with Jesus, you'll do exactly that same thing. Amen. Jesus was a man of prayer. Hebrews 5, 7 says, During the days of Jesus' ministry, life and ministry on earth, he cried out to the one who could save him from death, and it says he was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus cried out with loud cries and with tears and with great petitions to Father. Psalm 2, I forget what verse it is. It might be verse 6 might be verse 8. It says the Father, it's a, it's a prophetic psalm about the Son of God, and it has God the Father saying to his Son, Today I have become your Father. And then he says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as, uh, as your possession, the ends of the earth as your lasting possession. So even Jesus has to pray and ask, Father, for every soul that's saved from every nation to the ends of the earth. And we need to enter into that ministry of prayer and that ministry of intercession. Believe in God for the ends of the earth. Believe in God for the one that's far from God that's right around the corner and for the one that's somewhere on the other side of the planet. The early church was a people of prayer. Prayer was primary in their life. In Acts chapter 6, we can read the apostles saying, we will give ourselves to the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. They gave themselves to it. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, speaks about them being devoted to the apostles' teaching and to prayer and to the fellowship. Prayer was primary, and they saw the power of God being released in unprecedented ways. As a matter of fact, the power grew. I love how it says this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Man, the gospel grows in power. The word of the Lord increases and grows in power. It says that in Acts chapter 19. It says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. See, Jesus had great, did great things, but he said, greater things than these will you do. We see a woman with an issue of blood coming up and grabbing the, the hem of Jesus' robe because she said I, in, in her heart she knew if I can just touch the edge of his garment, I'll be healed. And she was healed and Jesus felt power go out from him. But in Acts chapter 5, people said if we can just get our sick and our demon possessed in the shadow of Peter as he's going to the temple to pray at the hour of prayer, they'll be healed. And they were. That's greater things, amen? That's the power of God growing through a people of faith and who believe him for the impossible. And say, they said, we will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The apostle Paul was obviously a man of prayer. And here we see him praying for a church that he had never even visited yet. He wasn't there physically to start it, although he had started many churches in person. And we can read about it in the book of Acts, starting in Acts chapter 13 and going on. Paul birthing churches because of the call and the gift of God. But here as an apostolic father, praying for this church that he had birthed in prayer. He's saying, we never stop praying for you. We're always asking God to do certain things in you. And he said, We're, we never stop praying that God will fill you with the knowledge of his will 
through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's the one thing he was praying for them. He said, I'm praying this thing that many things can happen. And you see, prayer produces fruit. It produces good fruit in our lives. As individuals, if we'll be a, a, a person of prayer, we'll see the fruit of God flowing in our lives. Jesus said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will remain. And he says, this is how it happens. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Remain in me, you'll bear fruit. Remain in Jesus. It's simple. Let's not complicate it. Let's trust him for the power. And the Apostle Paul said, I'm praying that you would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. That's very important for prayer. In 1 John, it says that we have this confidence in prayer. That if we pray in accordance with Father's will, he hears us. And if he hears us, we have the petitions that we desire. We need to know the will of God. If I'm just praying Angelo's will, God isn't too excited about that. But if I'll connect my heart to his and start praying the things that are on his heart, God gets real excited about that. Amen? God says, I'm there. I'm in that. They want more of me. I love that song. Man, that's so powerful. I could have sang that song the rest of the day as well. Worship team, amazing job. Very exciting, very powerful, very anointed. Want more of him. And so Paul said, we're praying that God will fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the understanding and the wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit. Everything that God does, He does by His Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. If you're just trying to do it in your own strength, forget about it. But if you're relying on the power of God, you'll see great things happen. Through the wisdom and the understanding that comes from the Spirit. Jesus did nothing. He did not perform one miracle, but by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the manifestations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in his life. And he set the example that we can do the same thing and we can do greater things. So he said, that's what I'm praying for you. And he says, this is why I'm praying for you. That you might live a life worthy of the Lord. God wants us to live a life that says we're his children. That everybody that sees us, they they hear the way we talk, they see the things we do, they see the joy of God, and I'll get to that in a few moments. They say something's different about them. There's a life of God in them. Live a life worthy of the Lord. What does that mean for you as an individual? See, God created you uniquely. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared in advance for you to walk in. God's got a plan and a purpose for your life, and it's a great one. It's better than good. It's great. It's better than great. It's amazing. He's got an amazing plan for your life. And when we walk in everything that God has for us, We're living a life worthy of him. What will it take for you? Man, it takes surrender to the Lord. Jesus was surrendered to Father's will. And he lived an extraordinary life. And we can live a life worthy of him. What kind of life is worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you'll surrender to the Lord and trust his grace and the power of his Holy Spirit, you'll live in victory. You'll live in purity and in holiness. You won't do the things the rest of the world is doing. You'll live a different life. You'll be different. We're supposed to be different than the rest of the world. We're supposed to be a people that have the presence and the anointing of God on our lives. That's how we set captives free. That's how the the worst of sinners get saved. Live a life worthy of the Lord. And thank God that people are praying for you, that you'll live a life worthy of the Lord. You can pray it for yourself, too. I was sharing it a bit, and I'll just throw it out there right now. There's a progression in our prayer life. Our prayer life begins first with seeing our need for Jesus, realizing that we're sinners and that we call upon the Lord and we're saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus shall be saved. And the first prayer we ever really pray, you know, I, and maybe that's not completely true. I don't want to say something because I played, prayed prayers that I know God answered and I know what happened before I was really born of the spirits. 
but God wants to hear us in our sinful state, crying out to him for what Jesus Christ has paid for, the forgiveness of our sins and the, to give us the free gift of eternal life. So our prayer life begins with just asking the Father to forgive our sins and to come into our life for Jesus to be our Savior and Lord. And then the life of Jesus begins to flow through us. Then our prayer progresses to a place where maybe we're trusting God for our needs and we're praying for the things that we need rather than worrying about them, rather than being anxious, rather about doing stupid stuff that we used to do and maybe medicating ourselves with either drugs or alcohol or all kinds of other junk because we're overwhelmed with our situations and with our past or whatever it is. We begin to trust God and, cry, and just cry out to God in petitions to meet our needs and to, be mad and to intervene in our situations, and he does it. But then our prayer life progresses to a place where we're not just concerned for ourselves, but we're entering into the, the sufferings of Jesus, so to speak, where Romans chapter 8 says that we don't even know how to pray, but the Spirit helps us in our weakness and, and, and groans through us. In, in, in intercession that's in perfect accordance with Father's will. We begin to pray for others. We begin to ask God to do great things in other people. We, be, we ask God to save souls and to save that person that's, that's treating us lousy or that ripped us off or that said something bad about us or that victimized us or whatever it is. We begin to pray for other people. We begin to pray for our neighbors and for neighborhoods and for our cities and even for our nation and to see God do amazing things. Our prayer life progresses. See, the Apostle Paul prayed that they prayed for them to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God through wisdom and understanding from the Spirit to live a life worthy of the Lord. Then he also prayed for them uh, that that they may please God in every way. Man, I want to please God in every way. I want to please Him. I want to live a life that pleases God. If we're living to please somebody else, to please men, to please you know, somebody that, you know, that's putting peer pressure on us or whatever, we're not going to please God. If you'll take your stand and say, I'm going to please God, I'm going to be obedient to Him, God is pleased with that. I want to please God in every way, and we can please God in every way. Jesus was pleasing to God, to Father. I shared this again in first service. It came spontaneously then, but, you know, I'll repeat it now. Jesus got baptized in the Jordan River, even though he had no sin. He, he submitted to a baptism of repentance because he, identif he was identifying, uh, really beginning to take the sins of the world on himself. He was identifying with the sinful state of man. And he went to John the Baptist in the Jordan River, and John knew, man, John was the one that declared, the one that comes after me, he baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. John wanted that baptism. Jesus came to him, and John said, I need your baptism. And Jesus said, no, you baptize me in your baptism to fulfill all righteousness, he knew it would please the Father. And as he was baptized, the heavens were open, and the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus like a dove and stayed there. And the voice of Father spoke from the heavens, Behold my Son, in whom I am well pleased. We have the same Spirit at work in us to please the Father in every way. You can hear the words every day of your life, This is my Son, you are my daughter, in whom I am well pleased. The next thing that Paul said would come, would be fruit out of that one prayer that he was praying, is that they would bear fruit in every good work. And I already shared about this from John chapter 15 a little bit. God's called us to bear fruit. Bear fruits of repentance. There are fruits of, you know, the work of God in our life that people will see. And again, it's just by abiding in the vine. Jesus says, I'm the vine. And you're the branches. Abide in me, and you'll bear fruit. God wants you to bear so much fruit that you won't know what to do with it. Fruits change lives. An encouraged person. Somebody that's never experienced love from somebody else. They're going to look in your eyes, and you're going to see the love of Jesus there. And they're going to know they're loved. That's fruits of the work of God in your life. He wants you to bear fruit in every good work, and you guys are doing a lot of good work down here. You guys are bearing a lot of fruit. I'm here to tell you it's going to grow. It's going to multiply. 
It's going to multiply. You'll see more laborers raised up. Pray to the Lord of the harvest for more laborers. You'll see church planters raised up. They're being raised up. Even now, you'll see more churches being planted out of this church. Indeed, uh, City Reach Church in Philly is coming into existence because City Reach Church in Reading is in existence right now. Hallelujah. You'll see more than that. Man, I'm excited about multiple churches being planted on the same day. That's a litter of churches. That's not just a church plant. That's a litter. We had a, a strategy week. It was kind of a mini, um, mini church planters boot camp back on, uh, in, in Pittsburgh in, I don't know if it was November, October, November. I can't remember for sure. It was in the fall sometime, and we were actually having our meetings at at Allison Park Church, and Pastor Brian Balti was one of the facilitators of it, and he came in at the, near the end of, a, of a, one particular s session, as he has a habit of doing, and just kind of blew the whole thing up in the Holy Spirit, you know, and so we were having this time in the Holy Spirit, and we began laying hands on church planters that were there and prophesying over them, and I clearly heard the Spirit say multiple births multiple birds and I began to declare it over those that were there but just over the network and just out just into the atmosphere that it's not just going to be one church planted here and there at a you know these great lengths of time you know in Hosea it speaks about that the reaper is going to overtake the one that's sowing this is going to be this acceleration in the kingdom and we're seeing that acceleration where years ago maybe a church would plant one church after many years you know, but we're, we're seeing an acceleration where multiple births are being taken place, where not only multiple churches are being birthed on the same day, I believe we're going to see even twins, you know, two churches birthed out of, a, out of one church or one, one church planted, planting two churches at a time. I believe we're going to see that. I believe we're going to be international. I shared this in the first service as well. Maybe one of you guys, maybe more, will be part of, I don't know, the Lord might put, the same way he put a Toledo on the heart of Jonathan Landis, he might put a, a city and another nation on your heart, I don't know. And you might plant City Reach Church, um, I don't know, Mandevut, whatever that means. India, oh, you're going to India, Mike. Maybe. Uh. Where am I? I should be done by now. But you're going to bear fruit in every good work. Amen? Then he says that you might be strengthened with power according to his glorious might. I'm probably missing something there, but that's okay. Growing in the knowledge of God. That goes without saying. Amen? God wants you to grow. I think it's Colossians 3.18 says, Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now maybe it's another scripture, but it says it in there. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The more you grow in your knowledge of him, you see, you think God is so huge. We'll never really know him completely until we're with him in glory. But we can know him more and more and more and more and more. And the more you know him, the more you love him, the more you love him, the more you'll make him known to somebody else. And the more you'll see his power flowing through you to touch somebody else's life with his power and his love. Amen. Then he says, being strengthened with power according to his glorious might. Ephesians chapter 6 says, we're not wrestling against f flesh and blood, but against the powers of darkness in the heavenly realms. We need his power. We're wrestling with evil princes in the heavenly realms, demons, demonic strongholds, demonic powers that we have victory over in Jesus, but only in Jesus. And so Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, and take your stand in the evil day, the armor of God. Then it goes on to say in verse 18 of, of Ephesians 6, Praying in the Spirit, on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and supplications. Now, prayer is a lot more than now I lay me down to sleep. Prayer is a lot more than thank you, God, for this pizza. No, make it make me any fatter than I already am, you know? And the Lord says, don't eat eight pieces and you won't get fatter. But I like it. On the eighth day, you know, on the, actually on the seventh day when God rested, he was eating pizza. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of that, but... Uh, <laughs> 
It's one of the best ways to rest is to have a nice slice of pizza. But we need the power, the power of God to strengthen us. And Paul says, I pray this specific thing so that you might have great endurance. See, a lot of people start good or they start quick and then they fall off or things get tough and they just quit. God wants you to have great endurance. He wants you to finish strong. He wants you to be a stronger finisher than you were a starter. He wants you to be going stronger at the end. See, your end will be greater than your beginning. The best is yet to come. Amen. The glory of the latter will be greater than the glory of the former. This new covenant that he's made as competent as ministers of by his spirit is a covenant of ever-increasing glory. So it's going to get better and better and better. You'll have great endurance or you'll have patience. We'll understand that everything doesn't happen exactly when we want it to happen. Maybe not even in the way we expect it to happen. I was sharing about on my way to Pittsburgh, stopping at McDonald's, just going through the drive through Before you knew it, I had two Egg McMuffins, hallelujah. I had them down before I got to the turnpike, which was only a couple of minutes away. But I was a happy turnpike driver at that particular point. But things can take time in the kingdom. But know that God's at work even if you can't see him at work. God is doing stuff in the spirit. God is arranging things. There are some things where God wants to do a greater thing than you ever even think. So he has to orchestrate some other factors to come into play. And some things that take a little bit more time. But the more time it takes, the greater that thing will be. The greater power that you'll see be released. The greater glory you'll be able to carry because of the persecutions that you'll, that you'll uh, just push through. And great patience and then giving joy and thanks, thanksgiving unto the Lord. That's so key. We can either be grumblers and complainers or we can be thankful people. Giving thanks to the Lord. Man, give thanks in the midst of your mess. I remember before I got saved, one of the men that was very instrumental in our coming to the Lord, he was a Christian chiropractor. Pat Delamere was his name. And he used to invite me to breakfast where the gospel was preached. And he knew, he looked, you know, he said, this guy likes to eat. I'm going to invite him to a breakfast where the gospel is being preached. But every time I saw him, he was praising God. He was thank, even if something bad was happening. I remember his son, his 16-year-old son, his oldest son, had dove into a lake, hit a rock, broke his neck, and the doctors were saying he'll never walk again if he survives. And he says, I don't receive that. In the midst of that, he gave thanks to God. Kind of like what Job say, said, even if you slay me, I will yet praise my God. Man, praise him in the midst of your situation, and you'll see the victory and the breakthrough of God coming forth. Thank him for who he is, for what he's done. Amen. Have the joy of the Lord. Joy is contagious. Amen, joy. Joy, joy for Jesus. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Man, God wants us to live hilarious lives. We can be serious about the kingdom and have great joy. In Psalm 126, it says, man, when the Lord restored our fortunes, when the Lord restored us to health, when the Lord brought us back out of captivity, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, and we said, the Lord has done great things, and we are glad. Then it went on to say, he who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. I'm almost going to segue into my next part here, but I want to speak about this guy at Paphras for a second. So here we see the Apostle Paul and Timothy and and that apostolic team praying for this church because it's important for us to be built up in God. It's important for us to have the might of the Lord, to have this endurance, this joy, to have the fruit of God flowing through us to touch broken lives and cities. This guy Epaphras, Paul said, he is always wrestling in prayer for you. And this is why Epaphras was wrestling. Let me just say the Greek word for wrestling there is where we get our word agony or agonizing. It's this contending. It's this giving yourself to contend to obtain something that cannot be obtained any other way. It's this wrestling. It's this passionate 
uh, strenuous, just uh, I'm giving myself to this in order to see the greater things of God come forth. And Epaphras was wrestling in prayer for this Colossian church. Here's the scripture. So that they may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. God wants maturity to come in his church, that we might be filled to the measure of the fullness of Christ. Standing firm in all the will of God. Let me tell you something, the will of God is not always an easy thing to submit to. God will ask us to do some things that we might not be ready to do, or we might think we're not ready for, or a little uncomfortable with, or I'm not willing to give this up. You know what? We need to submit to the Father's will. We need to be willing to say, I'll leave New York and come to Reading and watch God move in your son's life. We'll leave Reading and go to Pittsburgh and watch God do even greater things in Reading when we're not here and watch God do, bring a new season in our life. We're willing to do whatever. We're willing to go to these places and to plant churches and trust in God for the increase and God's doing it. Man, when a church... If City Reach Church Reading is standing firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured that God who called you is faithful and he'll do it, the devil is in big trouble. The kingdom of darkness must come down and the kingdom of light will be revealed and many souls will come to Jesus. Uh, and I want to just go quickly now into just speaking about Isaac and then bringing this thing in for a landing again. I just This is something the Lord put on my heart just in, in, in speaking about prayer. In Genesis chapter 26 and verse 24, it says that that night the Lord appeared to Isaac to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant who is his father Abraham. And it says, Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. I just want to speak about Genesis chapter 26 for a second. On this Father's Day here when we're speaking about uh, an apostolic father of the church of Colossae praying for them. And, uh, and, And the apostle Paul and really Epaphras wrestling in prayer for them is that Isaac was one of the fathers of the faith, but his father Abraham is the father of faith. Romans chapter 4 says he is the father of faith. He believed that God could call things that were not as though they are, that he could bring the dead to life. Abraham is the father of faith, and he was the father of Isaac. And we see that Abraham was a man of prayer and worship, In Genesis 12, we see him twice building altars and calling upon the name of the Lord in the different places that God was leading him. In Genesis 13, the same thing. Twice we see Abraham building altars and calling unto the Lord in the places that God was leading him, and God was blessing him and multiplying him. He had said, through your seed, all nations will be blessed. And we see that Isaac became a man of prayer and worship as well. And in chapter 26, we can see that he was a guy that was about not only building altars, but digging wells. I shared, I love this statement, uh, just the digging wells is kind of like prayer. You know that the water is underneath you, you just don't know how how deep you got to dig in order to hit it. And sometimes you just got to keep digging. You got to keep digging. You got to keep digging. Sometimes you hit, the, you, you hit it quick. Sometimes you got to go a little bit deeper. The deeper you go, man, the fresher that water is, the clearer it is, the stronger it flows. Man, don't be afraid to go deep in God. Don't be afraid to dig deeper. And, and if, in Genesis chapter 26, there was a famine in the land. It said that was different from the one that was in the time of Abraham, Isaac's father. In that time, Abraham went down to Egypt, but God clearly spoke to Isaac, who was a man of prayer. We, can, we know that because in Genesis chapter 25, it says his wife, Rebekah, was barren, and Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife to open up her womb, and God gave them twins. That's a quick, effective answer. Amen? That's multiplication. 
God did that for Teresa and I. We thought her womb was closed, and we prayed to the Lord. And God gave us twins. Hallelujah. Isaac was a man of prayer. He could hear from God. Don't expect to hear from God if you're not in communion with God. He may yell at you from time to time and get your attention. But I'm telling you, if you'll just sit at his feet, you'll hear him. You'll hear him loud and clear. And Isaac heard him say, even though there's a famine, he said, don't go to Egypt, God said. I want you to stay here. If you'll stay here, if you'll, tabern blah, blah, blah. If you'll tabernacle with me here, if you'll commune with me here in the midst of this famine, I'll bless you. I'll bless your descendants. I'll be with you. I'll multiply you. And so Isaac was obedient, and he tabernacled there at that place. And in that famine, it says he planted a crop. And in the same year, he reaped a hundredfold harvest. I want to share this about City Reach Network. God is calling us to go to places that nobody else wants to go to. That people don't want to stay there. They're moving out. God's moving us in. Not because we're anything special. Because he loves them. He hasn't given up on places. He hasn't given up on people. He loves every soul and wants none to perish but all to come to repentance. God is sending us, God's asking us, go to this place and stay there and I'll be with you and I'll bless you. God is sending us to cities where nobody else will go, to stay where nobody else wants to stay and to work with people that nobody else wants to work with. The 12 apostles that Jesus called to himself after spending a night in prayer, nobody in their right mind would have picked those 12 guys. Uneducated fishermen, and religious, I mean, I'm sorry, political zealots and tax collectors that people hated. And, God, and Father said, pick these 12. They were overlooked. They were overlooked by every other rabbi. They didn't meet the standards of anybody else, but God looked into their hearts and said, these can be my warriors. I'll use them. I'll use who nobody else wants to use, and I'll send them where nobody else wants to send them. In a time of famine, where nobody else was crazy enough to plant a crop, Isaac planted. And as a matter of fact, it may be the first time he ever sowed a crop. He was a herdsman. He was a shepherd. He roamed around from place to place, shepherd and flocks. If you keep going from one place to another, you can't be looking over your crops, right? But he was willing to do something he'd never done before in order to reap something that couldn't be reaped in any other way. And he sowed in a time of famine, and he reaped a hundredfold harvest. And he got so rich because of it. So he increased so much that they asked him to leave that territory. And he left and he began to unstop the wells of his father Abraham that, the enemies of, uh, of, that their enemies had stopped up, the Philistines had stopped them up. The enemy is always looking to stop up the work of those that have gone before you, your spiritual fathers and mothers. And you know what? We need to be about unstopping those wells and digging them afresh and letting them flow afresh. Amen? But we also need to be about digging our own wells as well. <laughs> so, so Isaac unstopped those old wells of his father Abraham and gave them the same names that Abraham had given them. But then he also began to dig his own wells. And people began to fight over them. And he kept going from place to place, digging wells. And finally, he dug a well where nobody quarreled over it or claimed it for their own. And he called it Rehoboth, saying, God has given us room in this place. And there the Lord appeared to him. He said, I'm going to be with you for the sake of your father Abraham. I'm 20 years older than Pastor Brian Boltz. But in a way, he's a father in the faith to me because I've come underneath his ministry and his leadership, and I see the favor of God on his life. You don't plant churches at this rate without the favor of God and the power of God at work. And Pastor Brian is all about prayer, and he's, he keeps telling me, Angelo, prayer is it. You've got to keep praying. You've got to lead people in prayer. You've got to champion prayer across our network. I said, all right, Pastor Brian, I'll keep praying. We're praying for you every week. 
We get needs from pastors every week, and we pray for them, and we'll do that more and more and hopefully unite everybody across this network in greater and greater prayer. You guys do first fruits prayer. When you show up for first fruits prayer early in the morning, you're digging wells. You're digging deep so that the, the water of God can flow in dry places. God said, I'll be with you for the sake of my servant Abraham. There are blessings that come just because of those that have gone before you, just because of your mothers and fathers in the faith, just because of what you're connected to. There is a, a DNA in City Reach that is a life-giving DNA that, that reproduces and brings forth good fruit. Dig deeper. Dig deeper and don't be afraid to do something you've never done before and watch God multiply it a hundred times. I'm going to ask, uh, is uh, Elizabeth in the house? I'm going to bring it in for a landing, but I, I need her minstreling behind me first. In 2 Kings chapter 3, there's an account of Jehoram, king of Israel, who was the son of wicked king Ahab. He was now the king of Israel, and the king of Moab revolted against him. And he rallied his troops, but he realized he needed help. And so he called upon the king of Judah, King Jehoshaphat, who was a, a great man of God, a man of prayer himself. You can read about him in one of the great places in Second Chronicles chapter 20, where he prayed for all of Judah in the midst of great attack. But he called up Josh, uh, Jehoshaphat and said, hey, this king Moab of Moab has revolted against me. Are you with me? And he said, I'm with you. I've got your back. We're, I'm your, we're, my people are your people. My horses are your horses. We'll be with you. The king of Edom joined with them. But they ran out of water in the desert. They had no water for the troops. They had no water for the horses. And they needed water. And King Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet among us that we can call upon? And, Jeho and Jehoram said, yeah, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is, is, is close by. And so they called upon Elisha. And Elisha came and he asked for a minstrel. And the minstrel began to play music and the Spirit of God fell. And Elisha prophesied. And he says, this is the word of the Lord. He said, dig ditches. He said, dig ditches and I'll give you water. Water for yourselves, water for your horses, water for the troops. Not only will I give you water, but I will give Moab into your hands. He says, and you will take fortified cities. You'll take fortified cities. God is sending us to take fortified cities. He says, dig ditches and I'll fill them with water. He said, if you dig ditches, you're not going to hear the sound of wind. You're not going to see any rain, but I'm going to fill those ditches with water nonetheless. And so they dug the ditches. And when the morning came, God caused water to flow from Moab and filled up those ditches with water. And there was water all over the place. And Moab, the enemy, Moab saw the water and with the morning sun shining on it, it looked like blood to them. And they had thought that their enemies were defeated and they could just go in and gather the plunder. But they didn't realize that God had set a trap for them. And as they went in thinking they were going to gather up the plunder of a defeated foe, Israel attacked them and had a great victory. And they took the fortified cities. Dig ditches. Praying is like digging ditches. You say, man, what's this for? This is hard work. And there ain't too many people helping me dig this ditch. Dig the ditch anyway. Dig the ditch anyway and dig it deep. Because the deeper you dig it, the more water will fill it. God will cause the water to come. I'm challenging us to be a people of prayer. As you go forward in this Circle Maker uh, sermon series, man, pray. Man, draw bigger and bigger circles. Believe God for bigger and bigger things. Dig, dig bigger and bigger ditches. Hallelujah. I was watching a movie yesterday at the house of our friends where we were staying here in Reading, and it was called Holes. It's a Disney movie. Did you ever see Holes? He's digging holes all over the place. They were looking for a treasure. It never rained in that place for years, and then something happened, and the analogy stops there. But you know what? We need to dig, we need to dig deep ditches, knowing that there's a treasure of God that we're going to uncover. 
and it's going to be a blessing to many people. I want to close with this. I'm going to ask you to stand up as I read this verse from Numbers in chapter 21. But as I do this, I want to encourage you to be a person of prayer for yourself, for your family, for your church, for this network. And to understand that there are those that are praying for you as well. So as you, are, as you pray, as you join in and pray for others, as you know other people are praying for you, that you're going to be a person that is standing firm in all the will of God. You're going to be a person, you're going to be a church that's mature and that's fully assured that God is going to do great things by the power of His Holy Spirit. That you're going to be a person that's going to live a life worthy of the Lord. That you're going to be a person that's going to grow in the knowledge of God. You're going to be bear fruit in every good work. You're going to be strengthened with great endurance and you're going to have patience. You're going to have the power of God at work in your life because God wants to use you. Your part is important. God is maybe raising you up to be a church planter. He may be raising you up and calling you to be part of a new church planting team that's going to plant a new church somewhere close or somewhere in a far off city. God has called us to be a nation of kings and priests. We're a royal priesthood in a holy nation, calling people out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And I want to read this last scripture. From Numbers chapter 21, verse 16, it says, From there they continued on to Be'er. It's spelled beer, but we can't say beer in church, right? So we'll just say Be'er. It's funny that the name for a well, the Hebrew name for a well is beer. Be'er, the well where the Lord said to Moses, Gather the people together, and I will give them water. You see, they had grumbled for water twice before. The first time God said, take your staff and strike the rock and I'll bring forth water. And he did that and God brought water out of a rock. Enough like like the oceans, enough to, to water the millions of people and the livestock and all of that stuff. Then they grumbled again for water a second time. And God told Moses, he said, take your staff and go to the rock but speak to the rock and I'll give water to the people. Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it because he was angry with the people that they were grumbling against God. But in this particular instance here, God told Moses, see they they weren't grumbling, they had no water, they were in the desert, they had a long journey. But God in his love said, I'm gonna give them water, Moses. I want you to gather the people. And what probably happened here was that earlier in Numbers, we see the Lord telling Moses when Moses was going to say, man, this, this is, job is too big for me. He said, gather 70 of the elders of Israel, and I will take from the spirit that's on you, and I'll put it on them, and they will help carry the burden of this ministry. And the spirit of God came upon them, and they prophesied. Even a couple of guys that weren't there at the time, they were prophesying in the camp. But I believe Moses gathered these 70 elders with their staves that represented their leadership and the, their, their, just their, their call to be a king and a priest for God. And they gathered together and they began to just call, call it to, to the Lord and cry out to God and, and thank Him for His goodness to them. And that He was going to give them water even though they didn't know where it was going to come from at this time. But the next verse says, Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well. Sing about it, about the well that the princes dug, that the nobles of the people sank, the nobles with scepters and staves, that that they took their scepters, they took their staves, and they just began to dig a ditch there in the desert because there was a well of God underneath there. Hallelujah. And God brought the water for them. We're going to do something in a moment, a prophetic declaration, because I believe that a fresh well is going to spring up, that old wells are going to be unstopped, that greater wells and deeper wells are going to spring forth with greater power in the Lord here at City Reach Church, Reading, and across our network. Also, I just saw this in the first service. I just saw it in the Spirit, and I want to declare it, that the river of God that it speaks about in Ezekiel 47 is going to flow from this altar out into the streets of the city, amen, to touch people 
to bring the life of God, to bring a great harvest of souls. But first I need to give this invitation because I don't know everyone here and I don't know if everyone's saved. And I just need to give that invitation to be faithful to my Savior. The first well we need to drink from is the well of salvation. The living water that Jesus told the Samaritan woman about in John chapter 4. He said, if you drink of the water I give you, it will well up to eternal life. It will be a spring of eternal life in you. There is a free gift of God that Jesus Christ paid for with his blood once and for all. It's the forgiveness of sins and it's the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. God loves you. He knows every sin we've ever committed and he wants to forgive us. He wants to blot out those sins and he wants to pour in his love and his spirits and his life and make you a new creation in Christ. If you're here today and you're not ready to meet the Lord and you know it, maybe the Holy Spirit's tugging at your heart, just convincing you that you are a sinner that deserves help, but God, Jesus came that you might have heaven and have a good life here on this earth. He came that you might have life and life to the full. If you need to receive Jesus as your Savior, that's where it all begins. That's how you can live a life worthy of the Lord. That's how you can be a part of something greater than you've ever dreamed possible. That's how God takes the unlikely people and uses them to do extraordinary things. On the count of three, if you need to receive Christ as your Savior, raise your right hand and then put it down we'll pray together come Holy Spirit afresh if there's anyone here in the house that does not know you move upon them right now devil do you take your hands off of off of the ones that Jesus died for and loves one two three is there anyone here that needs to give their life to the Lord looking around that I don't see any hands I won't belabor it. I just trust and rejoice that everyone knows the Lord Jesus. This is what I want us to do. And then I'm going to pass the microphone to Pastor CJ. Pastor CJ, why don't you come forward? Thank you again for opening this pulpit to me. It's been such a great pleasure and privilege to be here. But we're going to do what the people did in Numbers chapter 21. I'm going to invite as many people as can fit into this altar area to come forward. And we're going to take our staves or imaginary staves God has put one in your hand you just don't have it with you maybe Pastor CJ has got a, got a stick in the back I don't know but we're going to take our staves and we're just going to begin to pound them as though we're digging hallelujah that's a weapon right there I don't want to put a hole in the new carpet though so I'll be careful but we're just going to begin to pound our staves, our scepters, and we're going to cry out, spring up, oh well. There's an old song we used to sing. There's a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. It opens prison doors. It sets the captives free. There's a river of life flowing out of me. And then it says, spring up, oh well, within my soul. I believe as we do this, a fresh well, a fresh spring of God is going to spring forth in your life and in your spirit. But we're going to be a part of seeing a, a fresh, just the wells of God overflowing, springing up for eternal life in this city to transform this city, amen? So let's come on front, let's fill up this altar. If you need to stay in your seat, you can. And on the count of three, we're just gonna begin to pound our staves and say spring up, oh well, or sing spring up, oh well, or pray in the Holy Spirit, or claim the city. Maybe God's gonna put a city on your heart. Maybe God's going to call you into ministry right now. God wants you to know that you are one of those 70 elders, that you are important, that you are significant, that he can and will use you. He wants to use you in greater ways than you dream possible. And he wants to do miracles in your life. Hallelujah. Are you ready? You have your staff in your hand. I'm going to put mine in my right hand. There's something about the right hand of God. Hallelujah. Mm, there's water underneath your feet. There is water. There is a deep well of God under our feet. Oh, there are seeds of revival springing up. Do not be afraid to sow. Are you ready? One, two, three. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. 
Spring up a well. Spring up a well. Oh, wells of salvation. Wells of revival. Wells of healing and of miracles and of cities being saved. Spring up. Spring up. Spring up. Spring up. Spring up. Gifts of God come forth in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go with the we want to go. Hallelujah. Jesus. As we go into a, maybe that song, we want more. If you feel, if you want prayer, our prayer partners are here. Pastor Angel's here. We'll minister to you. Just lift your hand up and just whatever it is that you have, whatever it is, if God's calling you, if you feel a burning desire, whatever it is, if you're thirsty for God, want more of God, just enter in. Put your hand up so we know that you want prayer. We'll come to you. We'll pray for you. We'll believe God with you. If you need to go, feel free to go. Um, do we have any more of that bread left or is it all gone? It's all gone? Good. So if you need to go, bless somebody on the way out. Hug somebody on the way out. Just be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit's doing here at the altars. Hallelujah.